Welcome everyone to our virtual member speaker series on this rainy day. My name is Kate Gleason and I'm the membership director here at the Garden. Thank you for joining us. If this is your first time or if you're a new member, welcome to our membership family. We're so excited that you're a part of the Garden. Before we bring on Aaron to talk vegetables, please allow me to introduce another member of the MBG team, Joyce Gorell, Manager of Sustainability Projects in the Earthway Center. I asked Joyce to join us today to talk about this year's Green Living Festival, which is coming up in early June. Joyce? Hi, thanks Kate, and thank you for the invite. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from Aaron on vegetable garden inspiration. So this year will be our 20th anniversary of this garden signature event, and we will again be virtual this year. On June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, we're gonna bring sustainability to you, all of our members, and we hope you join us. We're uh, doing an enhanced platform this year, so you'll actually be able to visit a live exhibit hall on June 4th of the festival days. And again, we'll be doing a topical focus with energy efficiency on June 2nd, nature scaping on June 3rd, and Planet and Personal Wellness on June 4th. Uh, registration should be available starting as soon as tomorrow at mobot.org slash Green Living Fest. And we're going to have our schedule of events coming up very soon. But do take note as far as live events go, each day of the festival, we will have a uh, thematic focused live panel session at noon each day on June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And then on June 2nd, we'll also have live Grow Solar St. Louis Power Hours and lots of great information from our presenting sponsor, Amron, Missouri, on EVs. So it'll be a great time this year, and I hope that you do plan to join us on June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, and the morning of June 4th, especially with the live exhibit hall, which will have lots of great incentives for attendees. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Joyce, and good luck with that event. It's always a great way for visitors and members to learn more about sustainability, the Earthway Center, and all the ways that people can go green. In addition to the Green Living Festival, I have some other June events that I wanted to be sure to share. On Tuesday, June 1st, at from 5, 5.30 to 8 p.m., members are invited to join us for the member summer celebration. This event is all about thanking you for the tremendous and loyal support we've had during this crazy last year. The summer celebration will include live music at various spots around the garden, a chance to explore our new exhibit, Origami in the Garden, and fun activities for children. We'll also have free ice cream compliments of Prairie Farms. Registration is available online or by calling the phone number on the back of your membership card. We also have two installments of the virtual member speaker series coming up in June. On Thursday, June 3rd at 11 a.m., Kevin and Jennifer Box, who are the artists and producers of the Origami in the Garden exhibition, will join us to give insight about the show, their process, and the work they do with some of the world's most renowned origami artists to turn delicate paper creations into larger-than-life metal sculptures. Then on June 22nd, a program I'm really excited about at 11 a.m., we'll welcome Andrew Wyatt, who's the Garden's Senior Vice President of Horticulture, and Michael Ferguson, who's the Principal at Michael Ferguson Landscape Architects, for a presentation on the landscape plans surrounding the new Jaxi Taylor Visitor Center. It really is the plants, the new gardens and vistas that will bring the Jaxi Taylor Visitor Center project to life. And Andrew and Michael will take us behind the scenes to talk about their work to create that plan. Again, registration for all virtual member speaker series is uh, required. It's available online just by going to mobot.org and following the link to the membership section, or again, the phone number on the back of your membership card. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Erin Lynn Vogel to the screen today. Erin holds a BS in horticulture, landscape design, construction and management from Michigan State University. Prior to his career at the Garden, Aaron worked as the landscaping supervisor for Dogwood Canyon National Park in Lampy, Missouri, and completed a variety of plant and horticulture internships with Disney, where he helped develop the first ed edible garden approved for, for on-site Walt Disney World restaurants. Aaron began working at the Garden as an outdoor horticulturalist in the Kemper Center for Home Gardening in 2017. He was responsible for many of the beds surrounding the building, including the terrace garden, ground cover border, perennial border, city garden, backyard garden, and the secret garden areas. 
He's also briefly cared for Kemper's indoor house plant displays. In March of this year, Aaron began a new role as the Horticulture Answer Service Coordinator, where he continues to share his years of experience and knowledge by coordinating the activities of the Horticulture Answer Service, researching and developing information for the garden's plant finder and gardening help website, and answering your plant and gardening questions through the popular plant doctor service. It's so great to have Aaron here. He's such an expert and we're delighted to welcome him. As a reminder, as we hear from Aaron on vegetable gardening today, please feel free to use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Aaron will take as many of those as time allows at the end of the presentation. Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Go. All right, yeah, so hello everybody and welcome to Vegetable Gardening Inspiration. Uh, my name is Aaron Lundvogel. Um, I have been working in horticulture for uh, about 10 years, including some of my time with uh, my time at school. I've been working at outdoor horticulture here since 2017 and then just a month ago switched over to the Horticulture Answer Service. So for anybody that's not familiar with the Horticulture Answer Service, that's kind of a garden help hotline that we have that we run through here Monday through Friday at nine to noon. Uh, we also answer emails. So for anybody that is struggling with their vegetable garden or something like that, we're the people that you can call, ask your questions and get that nice advice. Uh, most of my experience, I've worked with ornamentals. I've kind of had the good favor of being able to work with a lot of different things. When I worked at Dogwood Canyon uh, Nature Park, down in Lampy, Missouri. We got to work with a lot of natives and then I had the good fortune of working a couple of internships down at Disney World that gave me a whole lot of experience in working with edibles. Uh, one of those places is what you see here. Uh, so the concept of this is we had a chef that was really into the farm to table movement and wanted to bring that immediately to the restaurant. And so the different produce that you see here in the beds was actually used in the uh, restaurant to some degree. Um, Disney had been doing some food production. They have a big hydroponics facility that I worked with that is also an attraction that you can go through. Uh, but this was the first garden that I went directly from outside of the restaurant to inside of the restaurant with no middleman in between. I was technically a restaurant uh, employee there. Uh, we weren't able to make everything that the restaurant needed by any stretch of the imagination, but we had these raised beds here, a bunch of different container fruits and vegetables. Uh, there's a citrus grove over here to the side. And then we also had behind this uh, orange tree here, there's a little uh, hydroponic tower that we grew a lot of herbs and things like that in. Uh, so today I'm hoping to show you all how I was able to be successful. Uh, when I first started here, I had basically had six months working in a hydroponics facility, a couple classes in horticulture in terms of almost entirely ornamental stuff. Uh, and I really just kind of hit the ground running here with vegetables. I'm going to let you know how I was able to do that. Um, in addition to that, I'm also going to spend a little bit of time just to tell you why I think that vegetable gardens are an essential part of our food system moving forward. It's a really complicated reasoning as to why, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a snippet there as to why I think it's important. Um, but I truly don't believe that it's a frivolous way to get fancy tomatoes. I think it's something that can be uh, really integral into how we move our food systems into the future. So I always like to start with the main benefits of gardening. Uh, these kind of apply to just about every type of gardening. You do get a couple bonuses when you're vegetable gardening. And those bonuses are mostly the literal fruits of your labor. Um, so the main benefits, the way they break down are to your wallet, your food, and your health. So the food is the most obvious one that most people are aware of. Um, you get way better quality food uh, when you're growing it yourself. I used to think that I absolutely hated tomatoes, and then I actually tried a tomato that was grown in someone's garden, and I learned that they're actually delicious and not just a flavorless slice of wet that you can put in your sandwich. Uh, a lot of the organic food movement actually started by chefs in California trying to find high quality produce, and the places that they found them on were these smaller organic farms, and then they found out that not only did it taste better, it was so much better for the environment and in terms of production in all kinds of different ways. Uh, you also tend to get higher nutrition from the plants that you grow at home because they're left on the vine for longer. They have the full lifespan of that fruit to really develop all of the different, you know, little sugars and flavors and flavonoids and things like that inside of them that make them so delicious. Uh, you also just get to enjoy a much wider variety of what you would find in a restaurant or uh, rather in a grocery store. 
a lot of what we grow commercially agriculturally is been chosen because things like it ships well it doesn't spoil very quickly it's got a nice thick rind so that when you stack them really high they don't get crushed um, but there are just tons and tons and tons of uh, different varieties that have different shapes flavors uh, profiles things like that i did a quick check baker creek is a place that i like to get a lot of my seed from uh, they're a place that specializes in heirloom varieties in southern missouri and just for fun i counted how many tomatoes they offered and they have uh, i think it was just shy of 110 different varieties of tomatoes so if you wanted to you could try a new variety of tomato every year for the rest of your life through them uh, you can also see this picture up here is different potatoes um, what we think of as a potato is an extraordinarily narrow lens of what is available to be potatoes. Um, there was a study that looked at the potatoes are native to the Andes that looked at the native folks in the Andean region who were growing potatoes. Uh, and they documented that some of them were growing over 200 potatoes in the same field. And a lot of people think this is why those Andean cultures have been able to do it for so long. It's because they have such a diversity. They don't have to worry about as much plant diseases. You know, if this weird one over here gets wiped out uh, by a potato scab or something like that, and the rest of these are resistant, you kind of have that buffer within that field. Another reason why I think that uh, growing our own vegetables is very important is because of uh, the scarcity of food in some regions. The St. Louis City County area has 31 identified food deserts. And so these are places that don't live within a mile of a grocery store. And sometimes community gardens and growing your own vegetables are really the only feasible way to get fresh produce and nutrient dense food to you. Uh, if you're somebody that only goes to the grocery store once or twice a week and you need to have your food last you that entire time, it's kind of silly to buy these fresh organic raspberries that are going to go bad in four days. <clears throat> uh, especially when you can buy a bag of Cheetos for cheaper that's going to last longer the entire time. Uh, so by making these accessible to yourself, it really does just expand your total food options. Another way is your wallet. A lot of people talk about uh, how much you can make on vegetables. There's a lot of people debate on how much it is, but... Uh, what most people have shown that it comes out to about $500 to $1,000 worth of produce grown in a single year. Uh, also, investing in your landscape and the outside of your house is one of the best return on investments that you can get. Um, realtors say that you can get about a 1% to 10% increase on your house just by having a well-maintained outdoors, regardless of what the inside is. And also, just going back to why people used to want to have land in the first place, um, just to use your assets to generate income, to have land to farm and to grow things. Um, so your return on investment on seeds is you usually get about 10 times the price in seeds returned on in produce. So if you spent $1 on seeds, you get $10 in produce. Uh, at that place that I mentioned out at Disney, in the first four months that I was working there, um, I tracked all of the yield and all of the harvest that I did, and I compared it to how much it would have cost for us to buy it otherwise to see if, you know, this position was really feasible, if the restaurant was just pouring money down the drain, or if it was something that we could actually expand and be a self-sustaining aspect of it. So uh, in addition to the kind of beautifying the area, telling the story of the restaurant and that intent and making that connection of people seeing outside the restaurant, there's broccoli growing, I'm going to eat broccoli it really just sells that whole experience. Um, but we were able to get a decent amount. So we grew about $200 in fruits and vegetables, uh, $45 in herbs, which was a lot of the fresh herbs that they used in the restaurant. And then my real money maker that I was very pleased with myself was the edible flowers. Edible flowers cost a lot of money if you want to use them consistently in a restaurant setting because you need to get them fresh. They don't last long. Uh, you can't use any one. It is supposed to be the star of the plate, so it needs to be a really high quality bloom. So they were spending about $15 to $20 every week in edible flowers. Uh, they would get these pentas uh, very frequently that you see down here in the lower corner. They sold them as Egyptian star flowers. And each individual little one flower you see there, they would sell each little star for uh, a pack of 50 would be somewhere between $10 and $15. So every little blossom on a penta's outside was worth about $10. And I actually did the math on that. And it turns out that ounce per ounce, the flowers were about half the price is gold. So if you wanted to, as opposed to buying an ounce of flowers, you could have garnished your plate 
with half an ounce of gold. And I that always just completely tickled me. It kind of turned them into pretty little blossoms into gold growing on all of my flowers. So, and then uh, health is the final reason. And this really is one of the reasons why I, I almost always feel like a snake oil salesman when I'm bringing all of this stuff up. Uh, and I always have to relook into all of the research. And every time I look into it, there's just more and more benefits as to how gardening can improve your health. Uh, it's a great low impact exercise. You can burn about 200 to 400 calories per hour doing it. Uh, even just looking at a picture of a tree can reduce your blood pressure and lower stress levels. This is a picture of the radiology garden at MSU. Uh, they developed a healing garden outside of the radiology department just as a place for folks to be able to go to uh, and sit after they're you know, doing these very long and sometimes troubling procedures that they need to get checked out. And it was a place to just improve healing. Uh, they did this based on a couple different hospital studies, one of which, which is the one that most people cite for these types of advantages. Um, it showed that patients recovered faster in hospitals that had a view of a tree as opposed to a brick wall. Um, they had fewer complaints from nursing staff about the behavior of the patients, and those that had the view of the tree requested fewer painkillers. It's also one of the uh, number one things that has been linked to people that live either to the age of 100 or older is these um, gardening being an aspect of their life. Going back, if you look at this gentleman right here, this man is over 100 years old. And one of the things that they have shown is that he's able to keep up his lifestyle because he works on a small farm, he works his property, and it keeps him going. Um, it's also fantastic for your mental health. Uh, this is a horrifying statistic that I read just recently is that Americans spend 93% of their time indoors. And numbers of studies have shown that the city hurts your brain. It's just bad for us. Just the act of being in a city is overstimulating. And we just need a way to de-stress from all of that and let go. And one of the things that they've shown is the most effective at that is just being in nature. Uh, it can be used as a form of meditation. I always like to, if I'm really frustrated or feeling upset, I take a walk out in the garden, take your rage out on a couple little weeds. Um, they've done other studies that have shown that it uh, reduces the chances of dementia significantly in folks that garden versus that don't garden. And uh, one of the sayings that I've always been a fan of is that gardening is cheaper than therapy and you get tomatoes out of it. Uh, in Okinawa, which is another one of the areas in the world that they have really identified, um, it's called a blue zone, but it's got a place that more people live to be over 100 than anywhere else in the world. One of the things that people in Okinawa really feel like is essential in living your life to its fullest is having an ikigai or a reason for being. And like I mentioned with that uh, other gentleman that lived to be 100, they really do think that it is having a path to walk and walking it, uh, that you find happiness along the path, not that you walk the path to find happiness at the end of it. And gardening is just something that it gives people a fantastic outlet to go do something. You get a very tangible results for the action that you do. You grow tomatoes, you get to see the flowers. And it also just uh, gives you that little chunk of satisfaction in your life, knowing that you have a little corner of the world that depends on you um, and requires your support. So that being said, those are kind of what I consider the greedy reasons why everybody should uh, do it. There's just so much you get um, out of gardening. One of the other reasons that I just want to go over very briefly is talking about why I think that small scale vegetable growing can be useful in changing our current food supply. Um, these are all just some facts that I think show very clearly why we need to be thinking about it more often. Uh, agriculture takes 50% of our land, 80% of our fresh water is responsible for 10% of greenhouse emissions. It uses 22 million tons of fertilizer every year, 50,000 tons of pesticides. And then to top it all off, about 40% of the food that is produced in the U.S. ends up in landfills and is not actually eaten by people. And most of this is on the consumer side. I throw this one in here because a lot of people like to bash farmers for these types of numbers. But I think it is very disingenuine to complain about how wasteful these farmers are being when you then turn around and throw away most of what they have been growing. And most of that is on the consumer side. Actually, if you look down here, 
um, over half of the fresh fruits and vegetables that we grow uh, in the United States and in some of these other areas are never actually eaten. And we use all of these resources to produce them. And again, this is not to bash farmers whatsoever. I just bring these up as the reality of where our food comes from. Uh, it would be very silly for farmers to stop working on all of this. I mentioned earlier that Cheetos are, cheap, Cheetos are cheaper than tomatoes and they're easier to get and they last longer. So when we have a system set up to enable all of that, uh, it doesn't really make sense for the farmers to try and tell us as the consumer what they think we should be doing. We really need to make those active food purchasing decisions ourselves um, and do things like vegetable garden at home. So the one issue in agriculture that I'm going to bring up just to show as to why it's so massively complicated and as to why we really need to be thinking about a multifaceted solutions, not just saying farmers switch to organic so that the world will be a better place. It is your fault. So this is a map that is a breakdown and restructure of kind of just how the land in the United States is used. Uh, so about 50% of the land is used for agriculture. We have a good amount of forest and timber still, federal protected wilderness, national and state parks. Uh, this is about the space that most people live in. And here is the actual fresh food that we eat, that we grow in the United States. Uh, so this is just the first place that it gets complicated. Urban areas are expanding and they are expanding into what used to be farmland. Um, so we now have this system where population is going up, the space that we have to grow food is shrinking and you can very easily see how we get to this system that we have now of using tons and tons and tons of fertilizer and pesticide to grow more food in a smaller space. And so what I think is important is to try to move from having that sole agricultural pot that we're turning all of the food that we eat out of and divers diversifying that into other things. And as I'd mentioned, a lot of people like to point to either grass fed beef or organic food production uh, as a solution to how we're going to fix all of these problems. But the rub that you can see here is where we're gonna find that land to expand all of our grassland for our cattle. Uh, we don't wanna expand into our forests because we need all of the forests with everything that's going on with climate change. It's one of the best ways to capture CO2. We don't really wanna move into any of our protected wilderness. We can't move into our urban areas because that's the problem that we're having right now. Um, and so I, I truly do think that one of the only things that we can do to make an effort in the here and now is to start integrating more food into our cities. So all that said, I'm sure you're fairly skeptical of if you growing vegetable gardens in your own house can actually have any kind of a difference. Um, right now in the United States in 2019, uh, we had about 80 million uh, households. One of the good things that we got out of COVID, quote unquote, is that it really did drive a new renaissance in people gardening at home. I think 2020 saw somewhere between uh, 15 to 20 million new gardeners. And most of those folks are continuing on planting. They're continuing on planting again in the future. About one third of those people already grew vegetables. And if half of that total amount of gardeners that I was talking about here. So if we got 40 million gardeners all to collectively grow a 10 by 10 vegetable garden, um, that would be about twice the size of the city of St. Louis proper. So again, if we look back at this map, I think if we were to be able to take a chunk twice the size of St. Louis out of here, incorporate it into the urban housing is when you can really start making a difference and uh, why I think it really is integral to going future. This isn't new. This is something that we have done in the past. Uh, you have all may have heard of Victory Gardens. They were huge during World War II to increase our food production. Uh, and at the height of the Victory Gardens in America, we were able to produce 40% of the produce at home. Um, and then this next statistic here, you can see how that directly changed from 1975 to 2016. Uh, we doubled the amount of uh, produce that we imported. The amount that we produced at home dropped significantly. Um, and I think those two things are absolutely linked. Uh, fortunately, I do see a lot of hope. Um, if we can take that 40%, go back to doing at home, if we take that food that we waste and rather than throwing it into the landfill, we throw it into our compost bins so that we can kind of 
take that line that we have of agriculture and turn it into a loop so that we are then using our wasted food in our gardens as opposed to filling our landfills with them. I think that is the model of the future that we need to have. We need to have cities that have hydroponics integrated into them, food parks, community gardens, and all of this to be able to supply food sustainably for the growing population for the future. A couple of cool examples of this going on in the world. Uh, when I lived in Lansing for school, um, the Lansing Food Bank had actually created a series of community gardens. I'm not sure if it was 100% affiliated with them, uh, but I help volunteer out there every once in a while and about halfway home from there. There was a big corner lot that people had just grown rows and rows of raspberries on it. It was a community raspberry pot uh, patch. Anybody could go in there and harvest of their own free will. Um, I think they asked that you pull some weeds while you were in there if you were doing it, but that was just something that this neighborhood had decided to do. Uh, up here on the right is Lafayette Greens, which is in Detroit. Uh, the Detroit Greening of Detroit project is a really cool nonprofit that they have in Detroit that has done a huge amount of work around the city. All of these are different raised beds that I can't remember entirely how they organize it, but they do a uh, CSA and supply restaurants and schools and things like that uh, with the produce from all of these different raised beds, as well as to be a public park. So I think food parks, food forests, if you've never heard of a food forest, uh, that is just basically the concept of planting a bunch of edible and ornamental or edible trees instead of ornamental trees inside of a park and then just making that produce available to the community. Uh, Atlanta in 2019, I think, uh, planted the largest food forest in the United States. Um, it's going to be seven acres and again, just be completely open to the public so people can have a nice relaxing place to go to as well as to be going through a walk, pick an apple from a tree as you're going through and then continue on your day. Or if you are a person that can't afford to go buy in fresh produce, you could go to one of these public food forests and find your food there. Uh, last one on this, Belo Horizonte, pardon my Portuguese, I'm not good at that. Uh, it's a city in Brazil, uh, had a population of about 2.5 million people, and they were able to spend about 2% of their GDP and completely redesign their food system to incorporate uh, different farmers markets, uh, making sure that they had the space to be able to do those, community gardens, they opened public restaurants at a cost 50 uh, cents a meal, anybody could go to, you didn't have to prove that you were poor or anything to go there. And you had people, I think about 40% of their population utilized those uh, food restaurants. And they essentially eliminated hunger from their city by restructuring their food systems. And I've read some COVID things about them. They've been much more resilient in facing all of the challenges with the food supply in COVID as well. So with that being said, let's talk about some gardening. And if you heard all of that and you said, well, that is just fine and dandy, but I only have space in my landscape for native plants. I have great news. There are plenty of cool edible native plants as well that you can use. Um, corns, beans, and squash are a great example that people bring up all the time. They're called the three sisters because uh, Native Americans used to grow the three of them together. The Corn grows up, the beans wrap around the corn, uh, and then squash covers the ground, and they just kind of all work together to supply a nice diversity of food in a smaller area, as well as giving some advantages of being a polyculture instead of monoculture. So just growing more than one thing in one place tends to make them more resilient to disease. Uh, to just go through some of the pictures that we have over here, Ostrich fern is a really nice delicacy. They take those little fiddleheads that are coming off of them, usually saute them in butter. Uh, if you're having good produce, I think that's really what you can do 90% of the time if you're trying to cook for them is just saute it in butter, maybe add a little bit of bacon. Um, here is a pawpaw. This is a native tree. It's really kind of the closest thing that you get to a mango in northern areas that has a, kind of a softer flesh not exactly the same as a mango. There's more seeds in it, but it really has that tropical fruit vibe. Uh, this is a sunchoke or a Jerusalem artichoke. It's in the sunflower family. They have a tuber down at the bottom. You can eat those similar to a potato. Super easy to take care of. I think they're hardy down to zone three and have been grown and harvested again by native communities uh, across the country for hundreds of years. Uh, the set of three pictures down here is a potato bean or ground bean. Uh, Apios Americana, they have these gorgeous bean flowers, and then the part that you actually eat on these majority, majority of the time 
is these little underground uh, potato bean looking things. Um, they're also supposed to be a great delicacy. They're actually much more popular in Japan. Uh, I think they call them Hokkaido there. Um, but they're much more popular abroad than they are at home, but you can eat the flowers, you can eat the beans, you can eat the tubers down at the end. And again, it's a great native plant. It's a bean, so it fixes nitrogen. There's tons of utility in it. And probably my favorite native edible is the service berry. There's lots of different varieties. You can get them in every different shape or size. It really does it all for me. They have these beautiful, beautiful flowers in spring. They get kind of a small blueberry-like um, berry in the summer. They're also called June berries because that's uh, normally when they're ripening. If you can beat the birds to them, I think they taste better than blueberries. It's got a very similar flavor, except uh, it, it doesn't quite have as much of that bitter flavor. It's just a, an overall softer flavor, I guess, that really sour. Um, and these are just some of the very common ones that are easy to eat. If you get into some of the weirder vegetables and native plants that are out there and some people that really know what they're talking about when it comes to um, kind of scavenging and going through and knowing what you can eat at all the weird times, there are tons and tons and tons of native plants that you can regularly harvest and get some food out of. Uh, and also I mentioned that I am mostly an ornamental guy and really for me, the vegetables are more of a hobby. It always just completely strikes me how beautiful some of these uh, vegetables are. Um, I like to use tomatoes as an example because if somebody told me that I have a vining plant with bigger than a quarter red berries that slowly change from green to red and can drape out of containers, I mean, that's, that's just everything that you could ask for from an ornamental plant, and then you can eat it too. This variety here is Rapunzel. It's a delicious one. It's really cool to use in raised baskets, hanging baskets. Again, that variety was Rapunzel. Uh, over here is a hardy kiwi. It kind of makes, uh, it, it is a kiwi. It's not furry. It's different than the tropical ones, but they have the beautiful variegation, these little flowers, as well as that edible fruit. Uh, here is a flower of uh, chive. This variety is called chivette. Um, but again, why wouldn't you want to have this planted outside of your doorstep? And then once it finishes flowering, you have access to fresh chives throughout the rest of the year. Uh, this picture has kind of really been a huge inspiration uh, for me and really got me to fully click and change my thinking on using edibles uh, in our landscape. So at first you take a look at this and, you know, it's pretty, nothing astounding. And then you realize you can eat just about literally everything in this. Uh, so I love using green onions like this as a way to line a border. It gives you that kind of really cool grass-like structure that you don't get from a lot of edging plants. We've got sweet potato over here. This is an ornamental variety of sweet potato. Uh, so it doesn't make the best tubers, but you can actually eat the leaves of sweet potatoes as well. Um, you can saute them. Um, the chef I work for really liked, he called it a pisto. I think it was kind of like a pesto. Um, but he used that as a soup base with the sweet potato leaves are very nutritious for you. We've got kale in the background here, which no explanation for those. We've got some zinnias that have edible flowers. Uh, Salosha, which has an edible flower, and you can also eat the leaves on those. I am not 100% on the Cleome, but I would just about guarantee you that there's some weird tea or something that you can make out of it. It is always a good idea to double check before you eat anything because lots of ornamental plants are toxic. Basically, if they're not toxic, they're edible though. So if you do your research, there's a lot you can eat. Uh, over here, we have asparagus. I have asparagus growing up on the side of my house. Unfortunately, at this time of year, it's not the prettiest to take a picture of, uh, but it's just got this absolutely beautiful fern-like foliage that you know can just traipse and trail. And then again, you get asparagus off of it as well. This was a hanging basket that we did for in front of our vegetable garden. You can see Swiss chard, Cuban oregano. We had a trailing rosemary um, and a trailing oregano as well as the Cuban oregano. And there's also just a lot of ornamental plants that you can just eat. Uh, both hostas and daylilies are 100% edible. Uh, this was a salad that my dad made one year with some variegated hosta, as well as I think he got a couple different herb blooms from around his garden uh, and chopped it up and made a little spring salad. This is another one that's really popular in Japan where hostas are native to. There's a specific variety of hosta that they like using there. Uh, but every one of them are edible. I actually had fun on one of my internships where we had a big daylily garden. Um, and so I would just 
go through and try all the different daylily flowers. Uh, and it, it was just kind of crazy that you go through and taste all of these things. And every different flower has its own unique little flavor, even just being a daylily. Some are definitely better than others. So with that being said, I hope that gives you your initial inspiration. You're ready to get out there. And your next question is, but how do I do it? Uh, so there are, I would say, six things that are really needed to do it. Three things are absolute. And so that's access to water. You are going to need to be seeing if your plants need water and be able to deliver it to them throughout the summer. There are annuals popping up in random places. If you have a tomato volunteer itself in some place, it might support it itself there. But if you are planting it in full sun, it is probably going to need your help. Uh, also, it needs to be in full sun. If you don't have six to eight hours of direct sunlight, uh, you're just fighting against nature. None of those plants want to grow in those situations. They're going to get sickly. They're going to be more vulnerable to pests and diseases, uh, and you're not going to get a very good harvest off of them. So those are the material things uh, to think about when you're choosing where to plant. Uh, really, the number one thing that I think most people consider should consider is getting access to all of that light. And something you need to do is weed regularly. I get a lot of people asking, uh, you know, what can I do to stop weeding? How, how much mulch do I need to put down to not have any weeds? Weeding is a reality of gardening. If you, even if you have a 10 by 10 garden, you should be able to get through that and weed the entire thing in 15 to 30 minutes once a week. It's better if you go out there. I like to check on mine every day, pull a couple weeds, see how the produce is doing and go on. But if you are 100% averse to pulling a weed, gardening is not for you. Um, so those are the material things. And there are some cerebral things that I think help out a lot. One of which is planning. Um, the more you think about your garden, the more you're going to be able to get out of it. And then observation, just being able to be there, take note, notice when something looks weird and say, hey, that looks weird. Something has changed. What is changing? Is this change good? Is this change bad? Uh, and lastly, mentorship. I've had a great fortune of having uh, tons of great managers that I've worked for and a lot of people that have been a resource for me to be able to go to and say, hey, I was thinking about trying something. Have you ever done this? You know, does this seem like a good idea? And, you know, sometimes they'll say, no, that was a horrible idea. They tried it or, yep, sounds good. Or I have no idea. It's worth trying. Uh, every area is different. No two places can you make the same prescription for this is how to be successful in your vegetable garden. It really takes the active thinking, planning, and working with it um, that will make it successful. The line that I'm a big fan of is that the best thing for your garden is your shadow. And if you aren't spending time out in your garden, you are just going to get less out of it. Uh, we're going to talk about some intensive gardening techniques. Uh, so intensive gardening techniques are just kind of what I was talking about. There's more management involved, a uh, little bit more maintenance, and you're able to get more out of a small area using these intensive techniques. So even if you only have like a little two by two pot of ground or a couple containers or something like that you're planting in, you can still get a whole lot of it as long as you manage it right. And uh, just for an example of something that I've always thought really was really cool, this is a picture of the hydroponics facility that I worked out. This is one of the tomato trees. So just to give yourself an example of, I'm going to talk a little bit also and have talked about uh, how I think there are more horticulturally based solutions as opposed to our currently agricultural, agriculturally based systems to our food supply. Uh, so you can see the box at the bottom. This is a hydroponically grown tomato. It's not a special variety of tomato. It's just an indeterminate variety that was trained in a specific way to go up to this upper trellis. Um, they said numerous Guinness Book World Records using this method, a couple for most tomatoes harvested from a single plant, uh, total harvest from a single plant in terms of yield for a tomato, as well as the most square footage. Uh, they've done this with lots of things other than tomatoes. They've done peppers, zucchini, cucumbers, I think to just name a few. And so from a single plant, they were able to harvest over 1,100 pounds of fruit in a year. So this just goes to show in about three square foot of growing space, you can do some really incredible things if you know what you're doing, take the time and put in the effort to get it out of it. So there are tons and tons and tons of different gardening methods out there. Uh, we are only going to talk about the square foot gardening here. 
because uh, as you can see, we could spend all day talking about the different ways that people like to grow vegetables. Um, just a couple here to show you some of my favorites. This is pallet gardening. Uh, you seal up the sides, stuff it full of soil, and then you use these nice little rows to plant all of your vegetables in. Uh, it's really cool because you don't have to worry about weeds. You can do it just about anywhere. Um, you can set these pallets right up on top of soil so you don't need a whole lot of fill and essentially use it as a pre-made raised bed. Uh, over here is one of the prettiest aquaculture things that I've ever seen. So aquaculture is when you combine raising fish with growing your vegetables. So the fish do their business down here in the water. That water is then pumped up to these vegetables in these trays. It trickles down and then goes back into the food system. So you get both tilapia that they have in here. I've seen them done with catfish as well. And the vegetables and just this absolutely stunning table. Uh, straw bale gardening is a whole thing. You can buy books on straw bale gardening. Uh, we've got some nasturtium, peppers, cabbages, and kales all set up in here. Uh, this is a method of pruning trees called espalier. This is up at Michigan State University. Uh, so this is a number of apple trees that they were training to make a trellis. And I believe they were planning to try to get it to grow over the top and turn this into kind of like a little tunnel of uh, apple trees. So square foot gardening, again, I had mentioned a lot of them have books. Square foot gardening is one of those that has a book. It's written by Mel Bartholomew. Uh, if this seems like something that you're interested. Uh, you should go and check it out. I really liked it because it's super easy to follow. I actually kind of accidentally invented it myself, uh, which is why I had started doing off what I had at Garden Golden Oak. Um, and about halfway through, I had read about uh, the square foot gardening method and I realized, oh, hey, that's kind of what I do. Um, I didn't break it down into individual uh, square feet. Instead, I did plots that were three feet by four feet just because that works a little bit better for some larger vegetables. And again, I hadn't heard of this method. Uh, the basic premise of it, though, is that you just take the normal uh, distance between plants that they recommend. So if there's a three inch spacing, you would put 16 plants in one square foot. Um, and, you know, if there was four inches between them, you could put nine plants in each little thing. And if it's one foot spacing, you just put one. Uh, but it's really nice. You basically just ignore the row spacing that they recommend in a lot of vegetable gardening uh, because those row spacings are more to let wheelbarrows and tractors and things like that. And if you're doing a more intensive method of gardening, you don't need to have access for all of those different things. And those big rows in between row spacings are just kind of a waste of space for you. Uh, they really like to use trellises like this to wrangle some of the larger fruits and vegetables. So these are little beans, so they're going to grow up the vines here. We've got some tomatoes over here that they have the trellis at the back. So instead of using a cage or something like that, they'll train these tomatoes to kind of go back and up um, and take over space that way. So if you were to look at the University of Missouri vegetable planting calendar, which this I think is probably the single most useful resource for you if you want to uh, garden vegetables. It has tons and tons and tons of great information in it. Uh, it has planting dates, it has recommended varieties, uh, it has different types of vegetables that all do well. Again, this is just a little snippet that I took for you guys to use it. Um, the University of Missouri Extension uh, does all kinds of research on how to do best different things in Missouri and their vegetable planting calendar is absolutely fantastic. So again, if you want to use this vegetable planting calendar um, for the spacing and a square foot garden, you would just take the distance between plants, apply that to a little chart like this. Uh, and there are tons of little pre-made charts on the internet for, you can just look up uh, plants per square foot PPSF uh, for turnips and square foot gardening. And there's lots and lots and lots of different charts. Uh, square foot gardening is very popular because it is uh, easy to understand. It really makes planning easy. So in terms of choosing what plants that you are going to grow in your garden, uh, the most fundamental thing of knowing is choosing the difference between warm season and cool season vegetables. So what's the difference? Warm season vegetables grow when it's hot out and cool season vegetables grow in the cool, uh, cool times. So a lot of people get screwed up on this because they don't know which ones are which. They try to grow tomatoes in the winter when it's too cold for them to grow properly. 
uh, or try to grow cool season vegetables like broccoli during the summer and they tend to bolt, they ruin the flavor, things like that. Um, so there is no advantage to try to plant warm crops early. You getting your tomatoes in in March or April does not help those tomatoes at all. The soil is not warm enough. There's just a lot of things that the tomato need to grow successfully. So you're not actually giving them an extra month of growing. You're just giving them horrible conditions for a month or two until it actually gets warm enough for them to start growing normally. And then you have a weakened, battered plant as opposed to giving a nice fresh start going out. Uh, if I have any one goal from this slide, it is to get folks to understand the average frost dates. So the average frost date in Missouri is April 15th. So that means 50% of the time we'll have our last frost by that point, but 50% of the time it is still going to snow. I saw this afterwards. Um, we had that frost in late April. And again, that is actually a completely normal thing to happen. I checked the weather data and last year, April 18th, it was about 32 degrees. Um, so if you are having anxiety about frost impacting your plants, keep these two things in mind, understand these dates, and you won't have to panic about your vegetables. Uh, if you do like to get out and start a little bit early, you can either use a cold frame like the one that you see here or a low tunnel. So this is basically just having a setup so that if you need to put frost cloth on it, you already have these handy little hoops that you can just roll right over the top. Uh, a lot of people try to throw their sheets just over the top of their plants, um, but that uh, doesn't work. You really need to have that air pocket on the inside in both cold frames kind of makes a tiny mini greenhouse and low tunnels are good ways to insulate and protect your plants. But again, as long as you are sticking with the cool season vegetables while it is cold outside and the warm season vegetables while it's hot, you will be fine. This is a picture of my poor little potatoes here that I thought got absolutely axed by that late cold that we had. But I've been very pleased to see that they've been completely regrowing and I didn't have anything die from that cold weather. Um, speeding up here and just going through a couple of my favorite cool season vegetables that I like to grow. I really like growing things that um, don't bolt in the heat or at least uh, don't as often and things that you can harvest at any time. So St. Louis has very fickle weather. Uh, so did Florida. It gets real hot real quick. And a lot of times I can absolutely ruin the flavor of what you're making. So I really like growing things like bok choy and turnips. You can see when I first planted them, I got some initial harvests uh, of these little baby turnips. And then as they got big, and as soon as I was ready to put my next plants in there, I had these more mature turnips. You can also remove the row in the middle of them to do a succession planting and really be continuously harvesting over a period of time, as opposed to just uh, doing a big one and going uh, trying to get all of your harvest at one period. Things to avoid are Brussels sprouts, Romanesco, and potatoes. Um, and even I'm not even as big of a fan of like broccolis and cauliflowers and things like that. I planted a bunch of broccoli and cauliflower last year that um, it got too hot too quickly and they all just started to bolt before I got to eat anything off of them. Brussels sprouts have like 120 days that it requires in order to uh, be harvestable. So that just means that you need to have 120 days of cool weather to grow a Brussels sprout. And just oftentimes we don't have that in St. Louis. But so I like to stick to things for uh, new gardeners and for myself that you can harvest regardless of what size it is. So leafy greens, lettuces, bok choy, cabbages, things like that. And then the root vegetables like beets, turnips, radishes uh, that you can get multiple successions of little ones as the bigger ones grow. Uh, a couple of my favorite warm season plants is really anything that has a patio or dwarf in the name. There's a patio baby eggplant that is really good. We grow it here in containers every single year. Um, and they're just better for the square foot gardening because they can fit into all of your areas a little bit better. Uh, cherry tomatoes, I think are the best type of cherry to, or uh, best type of tomato to grow. They're smaller, so you don't have to worry about the fruit bursting as often. Um, there's just a lot more of them. So again, you can get a more consistent harvest off of it as opposed to waiting for that one big tomato. Um, and they're just extraordinarily heat tolerant. So they really thrive in those hot, humid summer days and the cherry tomatoes just do a blast. Same for the eggplant. They really love those hot, humid days and can just thrive in, uh, thrive in them. Um, and then I also like peppers that don't need to ripen. 
Uh, here, these are some Carolina Reaper that you see in the middle. They also just take a really, really long amount of time to grow and then ripen. So it's just not a very efficient use uh, compared to, say, if you were to get a jalapeno. Jalapenos ripen and turn red, um, but you can harvest them with their green, so you don't just have to wait as long. Uh, but really, St. Louis is a good place to grow a lot of vegetables as long as you are doing it in the right time. Um, so planning, I really truly do think that this is the best thing that you can do to give yourself the best chance of success. Uh, when I started the farm at Golden Oak, I had only had about two years of work classes, six months of working with vegetables. And in that six months, I was mostly working with the actual hydroponic um, like the systems themselves as opposed to the vegetables. And this really was kind of hitting the ground running for me, trying to get them go. Uh, down here at the bottom, uh, this is my bok choy that I was actually just able to harvest yesterday. But this is the type of spreadsheet that I like to set up for myself for planning. So we have, um, this is just a made up setup for a two foot by two foot square foot garden to give you an example of how to plan for that. So we have four little plots, each a square foot. We have what we are planning to grow in that plot. Uh, we have the spacings, or uh, as opposed to the spacing in inches, you can put how many plants per square foot you're planning on putting them in. Um, if you are planning to grow transplant, this is when you need to, this is the seeding date for those transplants the time that you need to put your transplants actually outside. I like to include just the average days of harvest to give myself an idea of also when I should expect my first harvest. Um, and so this is for spring, then moving over to summer. So we'll have our turnips, bok choy, cabbage, spinach. As we move into summer and we get closer to that favorable weather uh, for tomatoes, which by the way, the weather looks gorgeous to get out there and do our warm weather crops at this point. Um, so we'll get rid of most of the turnips except for, or we'll keep most of the turnips except for the one in the middle to put the tomato in uh, when we're planting them. And it's mostly just the same information again. So we know when we're going to be starting our seeds for our summer plants so that it times out well with our harvest for our spring plants. Um, but really sitting down and making something like this so you know exactly what is happening as opposed to playing it by ear is probably the best advice that I have to give. And if you're skeptical of how much food you can actually get out of an area like two by two, if you do, you know, if you're living in an apartment or something like that, you're going to be doing all of this in containers. Uh, this was a little window box that I made and I stuck on my privacy fence at the back. Uh, it's about four feet long. Uh, I have some spinach and some bok choy, and that was all in it. Unfortunately, the squirrels have really been tearing up my spinach, but I've actually been kind of glad to see at least the one on the side that they don't hop in and out of as much as been recovering. Uh, but this was my harvest of bok choy that I got out of it yesterday. It was about a grocery bag full. Um, I put a lot of seedlings in there, so I or a lot of seed in there, so I know that I could thin out some of the smaller bok choy. These are all probably about uh, six to eight inches tall. This was after I thinned it out. So I'll probably get another two to three uh, grocery bags worth of bok choy out of just two square foot garden in a little over a month. Uh, I also really like doing maps. Um, this is a picture from the beginning of Golden Oak. This is just a little 3D rendering that I did. Uh, this is obviously way over the top of anything that you would need to do. Uh, I just had too much time as an intern. But to make the point that to get more out of it, it was so nice to just save myself time to have a map like this to say, oh, you know, those three um, containers over there, I was doing blueberry, mint, and rosemary, you know, how much would I like to do in all of these other things? And also just from a more technical person, I could say, all right, how much spaces are actually in between those panels at the back? Can I grow something up in the middle of it? What kind of spacing would I have? Just having a map of your garden is so extremely useful. Um, this is the hang basket that I showed earlier. Again, I just, this is what most of my drawings look like. I just like to do little sketches of here's the Swiss chard, here's the oregano, here's some rosemary. Um, but yeah, if you have an image in your head that you think of a lot longer before the time that you're actually doing it, it's very nice to be able to go back and say, okay, what was I thinking the other day by the time that you actually have these seedlings? Um, and then this is another just kind of 
me bored sketching. Uh, this was for a potato soup recipe. So each of these is a potato, each of these is a leek, and then we have some chives over here. So the concept of this is that you would time the planting so that you'd be harvesting all of these at the same time. And then it would be a potato, leek, and chive soup to be used up in the restaurant, in addition to just some other chives and things like that. But so you can see how this bed could just be plopped right into one of these um, and the transition and the action of actually making it happen is much easier. Uh, this is my plan in my backyard for right now. Uh, don't judge me too hard. I got a lot of stuff lying around. This was all um, my backyard. I just bought my house a year ago uh, and everything was just grass when I first got there. Uh, so this is what I am just kind of working on right now. Uh, I made this first. So you can see my little window boxes here, my baby little peach tree I've been working on on the Spalier for. Um, I've got some perennials that I already have planted of those APOS ground notes that I was talking about and some sunchokes. And then I'm filling in a lot of the space this year with just different like tomatoes, beans, bell peppers. Uh, this is really nice for me actually, because I bought two blackberries and I, for the life of me, couldn't remember where I was planning on putting that sec second blackberry and actually found this <laughs> to, uh, put together this presentation. I was like, that's where I wanted to put it. But so they're just really useful because you need to be doing the planning so much before you actually get the plants. Having a map and having a chart to reference yourself is just incredibly useful. Um, and then as far as observations, this is kind of the last thing that I think uh, is necessary for success. These were way, 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 way too in-depth. However, um, I was... I think this, if I had one reason as to how I was able to be as successful as I was, uh, would be through my observations, being able to say, hey, something is weird. Did that have aphids? Did it have a disease? Did it get at a specific time of the year? Do I need to be checking for aphids at a certain time? Uh, tracking the weather. If it's really rainy, do I need to be more worried about diseases on my eggplants? Uh, how much was I able to harvest? Did your plan work? And just taking all of those different types of notes are extremely useful. And so with that being said, if I can figure out how to open up you guys to some questions, maybe. Kate, if you... Yep, yep I'm here. I can read you some questions. It looks like we've there had we go. some good ones. And um, just to let folks know, if we don't answer anything, you obviously know how, now how to get a hold of Aaron through our, our plant doctor or our email, but we'll do as many as we can. So it looks like... Um, some good ones that we have, an early one we had. Um, I created a vegetable garden on a low sloping hill. I've not had too much luck with it. What can I do to get a better harvest? So that I would definitely um, evaluate your growing conditions. One thing I didn't bring up, which actually I should slap myself on the wrist, is getting a soil test. Um, soil tests are way cheaper than fertilizer and it's something that you should always test to see if fertility is an issue. Um, it isn't always, um, but it's definitely worth looking at. I would evaluate how much light you're getting, how much water you're giving it. If you're having less than six to eight, that can have a lot to do, uh, with impacting yields and things like that. But it, it's very hard to say without really looking at every aspect of your garden, it's not going well. What should I do to do better? You really kind of need to look at each of those individual environmental things and your practices. So I'd, I'd really recommend you to start taking notes and thinking about what you had done in the past, as well as comparing your conditions to whatever environmental conditions you're facing. So, so that slope might not be the reason. Yeah, I wouldn't. Ex if anything, the slope is good, I guess, unless you're saying, unless you're worried that it's flooding and that's why it's causing them problems, but there's nothing inherently, if anything, being on a slope, as long as there's more slope below you, uh, would be really good for drainage and things like that. Okay. Um, here's a question you may have answered because this came early. Where can I find recommend recommendations for planting bed with an aisle with? So it kind of seems like you, you address that, but any other issues about planting beds or raised beds you want to address? Yeah, so uh, the basic dimension for as far as wide for raised beds go, it's about, um, you don't want to have it any wider than four feet. Uh, four feet is just usually about how wide it is for you to be able to reach the center for both sides. So if you have really long arms and you can reach two and a half feet in, or if you're very short, you might want to consider doing it three feet. Um, but so the dimensions of raised beds really just have to do with what's making you comfortable. And as far as depth for raised beds, 
Um, you can do extraordinarily shallow if you're over land. If, um, if you are over concrete or something like that, you usually want to have at least 10 inches of soil for your plants to be able to grow in. Um, and then anywhere up to 18 inches, anything above 18 inches of fill is usually just kind of frivolous and you're doing it just for the sake of having an elevated garden. Great. So here's a question. What is bolting? Uh, bolting is when, so if you have broccoli or lettuce or something like that, it goes to flour and it usually uh, ruins the flavor. Okay. And can, I'm going to rapid fire here. Can yeah. artichokes be grown in St. Louis? Uh, yes, they can. They're usually not super successful because they take a very long time to grow, um, but it is possible to get them. We have them in the vegetable garden right now. Actually, this year we were able to overwinter one of them. And so we're hoping to get some artichokes a little bit earlier. Fantastic. Okay, so what about, um, can, can a tomato plant be trimmed? Mine get really out of hand. Yes, uh, so it depends on what type of tomato you have. Indeterminate tomatoes grow forever and ever and ever. That's the kind that they use for that tomato tree that I mentioned. They benefit a lot from pruning out the suckers and really kind of controlling the growth on them. Um, if you have a determinate tomato, that means it grows to a certain size and then it produces a lot of fruit or it produces the fruit that it's going to and then it stops growing. So if you want a more manageable tomato size, I would recommend getting a determinate variety or if you have an indeterminate tomato, go ahead and chop the heck out of the sucker. Great. And how do you solve the problem of squirrels and rabbits eating the vegetables? Oh gosh, I hate squirrels <laughs> and rabbits. Um, so the best products that you can use, uh, so a fence, a fence is the best way for rabbits. Uh, squirrels don't usually eat products they're, or eat produce, they're just like ripping things up and causing all kinds of mayhem on their own. Um, for rabbits, the best products that you can use for fence is not an option uh, are either blood meal or um, putrescent egg based products. So you'll notice them when you first put them on, you'll get a little bit of a smell. Uh, plant skid or liquid fence are two different products uh, that you can use. Um, but it just kind of makes them unpalatable to the, you know, there's a little bit of rotten egg and blood on their lettuce. They don't want to eat it. It's yeah. really useful on when you're first putting things out and then you can let the uh, plants just kind of grow and expand from there. That is the trick with them. If you have these herbivores coming through regularly is that new growth also needs to be sprayed. Okay, great. Can lettuce or spinach seeds start outside or do I need to start those inside in cups? Uh, yeah, you can start them outside. Actually, lettuce is one of the ones that um, you can get ahead of lettuce in 45 to 60 days. So it's actually does really well in casting out onto a ground area you know, harvesting some of those baby lettuces as you go through the year and then letting the, or through the season and then letting the bigger ones take over as you thin out those. You can, if you want to have a succession of lettuce and have lettuce consistently throughout the year, it's a good way of starting a couple of them in cups, put those into the garden, start some more in cups. When you're ready to eat your lettuce, put those into the garden uh, and you can do that, you know, on a weekly basis and give yourself a continuous harvest of lettuce. Great. And do you really start the seeds for basil, tomato, et cetera, only 30 days before planting? Yes. So seed starting, a lot of people, I basically just want to put out a little seedling. Most houses are horrible at growing plants. Uh, your basement is not as bright as outside. It doesn't matter if you have an inch away. So just for example, uh, a foot away from a standard fluorescent light that you have in an office it's about 100 foot candles. A foot candle is just it's a measurement of light. It's how bright it is uh, one foot away from a candle. So an office light one foot away is about 100 foot candles. Standing outside in full sunlight is about 5,000 foot candles. So it, it's just day and night difference in terms of what you're trying to grow them in. And if you try to get these really big plants super early in the year, you're going to have a sick plant that's stretching to find sunlight. And it's going to be this horrible lanky thing. Whereas if you can just skip that little section of germination uh, in a really nice environment where you don't have to worry about rabbits coming through and clipping them off before you even have your cotyledon fully grown, uh, you can start them inside and just push them out the moment that the weather gets good. Right. And also delay if the weather is bad. Sure. What about a couple questions about soil? What's the best soil for containers? Uh, potting soil. Uh, potting soil is different than garden soil or topsoil. It's lighter. There's more nutrients in it. Um, it doesn't, it does a better job of holding moisture while still having airspace in it. Um, skimping on potting soil is something that people always try to do of adding other fillers, but the best thing that you can do for your plants is use uh, potting soil. Actually for the bok choy that I showed in that picture of 
that little window box I filled with entirely potting soil. And then my little raised bed that I have up at the front of my house. I mean, the, the box on the potting soil is six to eight inches tall. And my other ones are like, <laughs> they're barely grown. They're just any bitty little <laughs> cuties. Um, but so it, it really is worth the money for high quality potting soil in a smaller environment. Great. And it looks like you have a variety of plant types in one garden. How do you manage crop ro rotation so as to maintain proper nutrient balance in the soil? So that's actually the nice thing about diversifying your plots is that you don't need to do as much crop rotation because you don't, you already have those natural barriers built in uh, as you're going through it. So you're just, you kind of do your crop rotation at the start of planting instead of at the end of it, but just having those kind of natural barriers of everything mixed. Actually, if you really go into detail on that, you'll notice that uh, in that drawing, I don't I don't have any solanaceous plant, so peppers, tomatoes, et cetera, next to another one. So I kind of have a rotation of squash, bean, tomato, squash, bean, eggplant in my garden so that I can avoid those establishments of those diseases in the first place, as opposed yep. to needing to do succession planting because I have a disease problem. Got it. So what about putting marigolds in my vegetable garden? That's yeah, mostly bogus, but they're pretty. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're one that people have said. Calendula, which are the ones that grow in spring, uh, the pot marigolds, those have been shown to do some nice beneficial things, but the marigolds for the most part, they attract pollinators. They're pretty. Okay. You can and eat them too. To, back to a soil question. Do I have to throw out the soil from last year if I do container gardening? Uh, for the same reasons that I was talking about with potting soil, I would recommend it. Um, basically that potting soil comes pre-amended, uh, especially depending on how nice of a potting soil you're getting. So you're, you're turning that potting soil into vegetables. So yeah. if you're not adding more compost and things like that, it will become more and more deprived through the years as they go on and more and more likely to carry diseases because in a container, you really can't do any kind of succession planting. The best thing that you can do is dump it out and get new stuff. Great. And then a lot of questions about tomatoes, the best cherry tomatoes for pots, and then the best cherry or regular tomatoes for a first time tomato grower. Oh, there are so many of them. If you <laughs> look at that vegetable, um, the vegetable calendar for Missouri, I would really, really recommend sticking with that. Um, I have not grown a whole, whole lot of tomatoes in Missouri, uh, I did one variety last year that was called Tumbling Tiger that worked out uh, okay. It was a determinate variety, so it didn't last the entire uh, year. But I had it in a hanging basket, and I got you know tomatoes through the end of June, I think half of July at least. Um, but yeah, there's there's just so many varieties. I do like that Rapunzel one uh, that we mentioned because I think it's pretty and it tastes good. Uh, Sheila, who does the vegetable garden out here, has had a lot of success with that one. Excuse me. So that that's one I would take a look at. Great. And a few more soil questions. Is is it better, is potting soil better than raised bed soil? And another question about what's the, is potting soil good for raised beds in general? Yeah, so actually at, at Golden Oak, they did just fill those raised beds with potting soil and boy howdy did they grow stuff. Um, the main problem that you run into that, I, I don't think raised bed soil is actually a thing. It's usually a mix of topsoil and compost that you put into it. It's usually like a either a 50-50 topsoil compost, uh, anywhere up to about 80% topsoil to 20% compost. Uh, for use as a fill in a raised bed, the main thing that you're going to run into is just expense. Potting soil is the most expensive, followed by compost and then by topsoil. So that's, if you have the money to do all topsoil or uh, to do all potting soil, you don't have to do any other amendments whatsoever for it. Great. And do you have any experience, we'll do a few more, do you have any experience with pheromone traps for squash bugs? Um, I don't, some other folks have, I believe they've used some on our squash here. Um, I think if you're, if you have an issue with squash bugs, I would probably look at a variety of things. Actually, that's one that there is a fantastic book on companion planting that the title of it is escaping me at the moment, but it's something like The Science Behind Companion Planting. Okay. Uh, for anybody that's interested in companion planting, that is the best book I have ever read. It goes, it's scientifically researched, uh, goes through a bunch of different reports and things like that and gets scientifically proven companion planting things that work. I know for a fact that there's uh, some with squash. I want to say it's uh, planting nasturtium uh, can help deter them. And then using something like a trap crop 
So uh, squash that the squash beetle like more that you put a little bit off to the side. So that they all go to that one and then you hit that one with a hammer when the squashes, uh, squash beetles come. Okay. Um, you can use some things like diatomaceous earth uh, and other things, but they, they are, they can be a pain. Okay. And then we had a general question about companion plants that you sort of addressed for natural pet resistance. Is that something that you use a lot in your own garden? And can, and can you say the name of that book again? Yeah. It, um, if you don't mind bearing with me. Yeah. Beauty of. <laughs> yeah, it, it really was a, an incredible book. It's called Plant Partners, Science-Based Companion Planting Strategies for the Vegetable Garden uh, by Jessica Waller, I believe. Jessica Walliser. Wonderful. Thank you. That's a great resource. And then I'll take a couple more. Best advice for wooden porch gardening, vegetables and flowers, content, container types, watering, vegetables that can, can't be mixed together, et cetera. So wooden porch gardening. I think, so as far as vegetables that can't be planted to each other, I have not really seen uh, any, any research that really backs up the uh, like onions don't like basil and stuff like uh -huh. that. I, I can't even remember any of the ones off the top of my head. Um, I do just recommend looking at patio varieties. Uh, they'll say patio or dwarf in the name. Patio baby is the example of an eggplant. Uh, but seed companies really market those because they know that those are becoming much more popular. Uh, I like using trailing varieties. If you can see a trailing variety, uh, partially just because they're pretty and they're functional. Um, so I think the, uh, the cherry tomato I'm growing this year that I'm planning on putting in my raised uh, window boxes that I showed that picture of is called Isis Candy. Um, but it's a pretty little cherry tomato that will trail over the edge and then I'm planning on growing basil up over the top of it. Uh, basil and tomato is another one that they have actually shown and there are tons and tons of um, good things doing with that. As far as what I'm doing right now though, I am just trying to go for diversify, uh, don't leave blank earth, getting lots of mulch in there, getting just a mix of herbs and other things like that um, to try and just have a lot of diversity. Great. And then the final question we'll take, how best to use drip irrigation? Um, so you really, the most important thing if you want to use drip irrigation is you really need to have the root zone of the plants you're watering basically right under those drip line. Water, when it comes out of a hose, likes to go straight down into the earth and you need to flood the entire earth if you want it to spread out, you know, much more than like a six inch or one foot band, most drip tape, uh, which is just the tube that they uh, come in will say, you know, this is how much we wet. But so you need a lot of the drip irrigation going through there and it needs to be able to run for a long time. Great. Okay, and then I lied. Final question, remind everybody how they get a hold of the plant doctor and ours and everything like that in case we weren't able to answer the questions today. So our phone line is nine to noon, Monday through Friday. Normally we have volunteers going um, as well. So please be patient with us just for right now. Um, but so if you're getting a busy line, we do respond to voice messages also. We just have tons of those as well. So if it's a very urgent thing, I would try and get us on the phone. It's usually taking about a week to get back to people. Um, we also have an email address, which is plantinfo at mobot.org. Um, that's a great way to send in pictures of if you don't know what a plant is, we do a lot of ID, um, things like that. But so you can call us or email us at plantinfo at mobot.org. I'm looking around my desk. I never call our line, so I don't actually know what the number is. Oh, I do because it's two digits off my own. It's 314-577-5143. I won't tell you what two digits, but my number is two digits off. So sometimes I answer the phone and people immediately bombard me with a gardening question I do not know. So it's 314-577-5143. So thank you so much, Aaron, for being here. Thanks everybody for the fantastic questions. Um, we'd love for you to get involved answering questions. I mean, asking questions of our plant doctor, keeping Aaron on his toes, although it sounds like he can pass any test because you were fantastic today. So thanks everybody. We will see you in June. As a reminder, we have the June 3rd presentation with the origami and the artist, I mean, origami and the garden artists on June 3rd at 11. And then on June 22nd, we'll be back for the uh, landscape design plan with the Jack C. Taylor Visitor Center. So a great program I hope you can all join us for. So thanks again. Have a good day, everybody.